title of my talk today is quite the mouthful, uh, but really what I want to touch on today was a couple of things from a meat and livestock Australia perspective. Really just wanted to set the scene, if like this morning, of the type of environment that we're working in uh, at the moment and into the, the foreseeable future. As producers really entering some uncharted territory, uh, we've certainly had some challenges over the last couple of years, um, and in particular the last 12 months, but it's a pretty positive story uh, that we've got, to, we've got to work with. Then I wanted to talk about, just touch on where, what Meat and Livestock Australia is doing with your levy, and as you would know that when you pay your $5 transaction levy on every animal sold, the majority of that comes to MLA, and it's our responsibility to invest that on your behalf in marketing and in research programs that will benefit you as producers, as red meat producers. So I want to touch on where we're focusing those efforts uh, over the next five to 10 years. But then I really want to bring that to life with giving you some real tangible examples of some of the immediate programs that we've got in place with results coming out soon or things that you can get involved in straight away. So I'll just kick off with like setting what's the environment that we're working in at the moment. And the reason I've got, you know, this is a, a shopper in Milan in Italy. And the reason I put this up as front and centre is that this person here is the only person in our supply chain that actually puts money into our supply chain that can go back down to, to us as producers and being a consumer. So meeting and exceeding their expectations is really something we need to keep uh, at the forefront of our minds is so we can extract we can get our consumers to eat more red meat, we can actually extract more from them because they want to pay more for that red meat as well. As I said, it's been a challenging 12 months or more, um, whether it's drought, fires, COVID, but it's a pretty positive story and environment we're working in because there is more, there's more global demand for beef than we can possibly supply. So the demand for our product is unprecedented. And that's our, our exports are intended to, predicted to increase by 10% over the next three years. And if you, if you don't, weren't aware, over 70% of our beef actually goes offshore into our markets. And we, so we don't have enough beef to supply the world, so we get to be picky with where we send it as well. And so really what I'm just putting up here, this is where we've got our bases of our international offices. They're actually working on the ground to try and find these opportunities to be picky and find the consumers that want to pay for our products. But it's a pretty volatile environment as well around the globe in that there, there's lots of things happening at the moment and can change things at any time. And uh, if I just, you know, the African swine fever um, in China that's just debilitated their whole pork industry has really left like, like a protein deficit there. And we've been able to capitalise on that, but that is likely to recover uh, in the next, in the short um, term future as well. There's a lot of politics as around the China-US trade. We're working with uh, on a, what's the FTA look like with um, UK and Europe following Brexit. So lots of things happening as well. And the competition's getting pretty fierce. And that there's South America uh, as probably our biggest competitor uh, from a price perspective. And that's not where we're trying to compete because we can't compete on price with some of these countries that can produce beef at a lot lower cost than us. Uh, but, so what we're trying to do and what I'll talk about is how do we leverage off the credentials that the Australian beef industry has to really find those niche markets that are willing to pay for it. But these South American countries are now getting access into some of the markets that we're used to having quite a big market share in. So they've been in China uh, for the last little while and, and uh, some of our processing sector has been uh, locked out of China in the last 12 to 18 months and we're seeing more competition come in there. And we're starting to see them enter into some of our more traditional markets as well. Some of these other, other um, competitors, uh, like Ireland, or not so much a competitor, but Uruguay, is they've got, they're actually starting to uh, make noise around their credentials as clean and green as well. So we're trying to stay, stay ahead of that. As I said, the world's a pretty big place. We're a very small producer in the whole scheme of things. 4% of the world's beef production, yet uh, we're one of the biggest exporters of beef in the world. We just don't have enough to su supply. And even if we sent everything to the US, they'd eat it all in two months. Our whole entire production here would be consumed in the US in just two months. Just to give you some context of well, what we've got to play with. So this is where I said we get picky then. So we're allowed to, it really gives us the permission to go and find those consumers around the world who will pay more for it. So the tipping point we've worked out is that when 
the income in the household reaches about $35,000 US, that's about the point where those consumers are willing to spend their, they, they're willing to start buying red meat as their pro preferred protein source. And if you just chase where are the people in the world, you would send all your beef to China. But if you overlay where are those consumers that are willing to pay, there the, it's not China. China is definitely increasing in that middle class income and we, that's why we, we have work in that, that country, in that area. Uh, but we also go and play in a lot of other spaces as well. So this is the strategy for our global markets. Here, Australia is still the single biggest customer for our beef. We have one of the largest actual beef consumption rates uh, as a population amongst the world, and we are still the single biggest customer of our own beef. Japan and Korea are very loyal traditional markets for Australia, and in the last 12 months, we've been able to really realise the benefit of developing those strong relationships in those markets because Japan stayed with us and they were our number one export market over the last 12 months. In these markets here, we're looking at what do we do to develop business there. In particular, the Southeast Asia market is a really emerging market for us. Tourism has hit it really hard in the last 12 months. But once that starts to bounce back, and we expect it will as the vaccine rolls out, we'll be spending more time there and looking at opportunities there. And then we, in our efforts in the UK and the EU, we're limited by how much beef we can actually send there. We're actually restricted by quota. So that's our efforts in those markets is trying to get more access. So it's not a one-size-fits-all in our attempt to put our beef around the world. Uh, we take a different approach for, for the whole world. As I said, the last 12 months, in, specifically related to COVID, has really devastated the food service sector more than anything else. And that's, uh, that it, in our countries that we send our beef to, primarily it does go into food service sector. So with that sector taking a real hit, we did see, uh, we did take a hit on, on our exports. But the retail sector increased, however, and the food service sector that was able to pivot and become things like takeaway, home deliveries, were able to recover quite quickly as well. But we expect the recovery of that whole sector uh, to really start to bounce back with the, with the vaccine rolling out. As I said, it's a pretty positive outcome and we've been able to weather the storm, if you like, to this point. I just wanted to touch on that. So that's a positive story. There is, people want more beef than we can possibly supply. Now we've got the supply challenge because this large, we're just coming out of a uh, herd population that hit an all-time low in the last 20 years. So we do have massive demand, we just now have a bit of supply challenge over the next couple of years. And so as you well experienced this week is that there's a, uh, the, the bombs predicting a 60% um, 60 predictability that, more, that the eastern states will get more than their average rainfall up until April and I think we we see that that's coming to fruition as well. Now, what this essentially means is, as you can probably appreciate, is that we're seeing less cattle on the market, supply is becoming really tight. Heifers are in high demand, people are rebuilding. Uh, although the, conf the way that we work out if, what's the confidence in the rebuilding at the moment, we look at how many females keep coming forward for, for slaughter every week. And it needs to get to about 47%. That's the trigger point that if it hits 47%, we know we're in rebuilding phase. It's still at 53%. There's still more females coming forward than what's giving us confidence to know that we're definitely in the rebuilding phase. But we expect that, that to turn over these next couple of months. Um, we're seeing that there was a bumper harvest last year. So we're seeing it's more, the margins are better for the feedlot sector. More than a million head of cattle on feed around the country at any one time at the moment. Producers have got the confidence to hang on with the feed supply. They're hanging on to younger cattle for longer. And both of those things are contributing to getting, we're going to get heavier cattle coming through as well. So whilst the supply is coming down, uh, or sorry, is down at the moment, it's being offset, if you like, by the increased carcass weight. The average carcass weight is hitting three, just over 300 kilos at the moment. So that means our volume of beef that we're producing is comparable to, to other years. But the processing, so this is our supply, so we expect here we are pretty much at an all-time low now and we're forecasting it to, to really bounce back in these next couple of years. But the processing sector is now feeling the pinch. They just don't have, as, with the supply being tight, they just don't have the number of cattle coming through for processing. Prices are high, which is a great story for producers and they expect it to probably stay that way for a little while, um, while ever producers are restocking. 
but the US dollar, the exchange rate has also hit over 75 cents, which is really hurting as it is an export country. It's actually making our beef even more expensive as well. So there's a few things in the recipe, if you like, for the processing sector, uh, which makes it challenging. And so some of our processes, because of supply, primarily are uh, starting to reduce their processing capacity as well. Uh, but all in all, it's, it's quite a positive story uh, and, and outlook over the next year or two. I wanted to move on now that if that's the environment we're working in, what's Meat and Livestock Australia going to focus on over the next few years to really make sure that we invest your levy wisely and we get the biggest return uh, on investment for, for that? And so if if you weren't aware, the last uh, the sort of whole red meat industry is set up with a strategic plan or a roadmap for 10 years, which was only released, we're, we're 12 months into it now. And it sets up what, what the red meat industry should be aspiring to be, be in 2030. Now, Meat and Livestock Australia is the primary provider of that to that plan, not the only one. But we take that information, we break it down into the, what's it mean for MLA, and so we've set ourselves some pretty aspirational goals in line with all of that. And they are, by 20, 20, 2030, we want to double the value of red meat sales coming out of this country. So there's a whole different way we can get to that, whether it's just trying to get more money out of consumers or do we reduce, try and reduce cost of production as well. We want to be the trusted source of the highest quality protein in the world. And this is where we leverage the stories around our traceability systems, our clean green provenance story, and even get better at that as well. We want to achieve carbon neutrality by 2030. I'm going to touch a little bit on how we're going through that. And we're going to double the investment, so resources and funding towards adoption and extension. So accelerating and helping producers and the entire supply chain get the outcomes of research that we are delivering and get them into people's businesses as quickly as possible. So you do get to realise the benefit of that research. So I just wanted to share with you, and this is a relatively new direction for MLA, and uh, the last 12 months we've been transitioning to this, but just want to share with you how we're focused on doing this. And is that we're going to invest in, in areas that bring data and insights together. So producers will have access to, to knowledge to make better decisions. Uh, we're going to have uh, big investments, targeted investments that address the big complex issues of our industry. So producers will have the capability to adopt those outcomes. Looking at new sources of revenue for, this, for producers and supply chains as well. And looking at how, what are the services that producers could diversify into alongside red meat production to even get more farm income. Environmental services and carbon Credits and so on is an example of that. Uh, looking at how do we get more out of the carcass beyond our traditional steaks and roasts and things that we, we know and love from red meat, how can we actually use the uh, co-products and, and get more out of the, pro uh, the carcass? Looking at some of the future issues that will be facing our industry, but doing that in collaboration with other organisations that represent other parts of agricultural sector as well and strengthening our core. So things like our integrity systems, the livestock production assurance system, how do we even get that even more uh, efficient, effective, and user-friendly for you so we can really leverage those stories with our customers? So every, pro, every uh, investment we make going forward will be in, led by an insight. So we'll invest in, pro, in projects or research or marketing ventures that tell us that there is a problem somewhere that needs solving, there's a gap in our knowledge somewhere, or there's a customer somewhere in the world that wants us to do something differently. And everything that we invest in will also have a really clear line of sight to adoption as well. So we're already, when we're already putting that money on the table to invest in some research, we're already thinking about who's going to use that information and how do we get those people, in producers, it might be producers, processors, uh, livestock advisors, how do we get those people involved in that process so we know that when, it's, when the research is done, it's going to hit the ground running. And so ideally, we're trying to link up the whole supply, to whole farm system or supply chain. So how do we get information from consumers telling us what they want, um, feeding back into, how does that actually inform breeding decisions? So that's the ultimate. If we can do that, bring consumer insights together, 
So if we make a breeding decision today, we know it's about three years away before this consumer actually gets to realise what we did there. So trying to link those two things together, so we're, we're, <clears throat> we're accelerating how, how quickly we meet their expectations. I just want to bring that to life a bit with some real examples of things that we've got on the go right now and things that you can get involved in, you'll hear lots about. So this is a bit of a taster, if you like, of not everything MLA does, but a few things that you might be interested in. So one of those areas is animal well-being. So that's a combination of animal health and animal welfare, and what we call well-being. And so what we're looking at over the next five years is being able to come up with a index, one single value that represents that animal's lifetime well-being. Is anyone familiar with the MSA index based on eating quality? If you, so similar concepts. So one single value to represent an animal. So the MSA index is about what are the factors on farm that affect eating quality. Similar concept, we're going to look at what are the things that affect an animal's lifetime well-being. Now we don't know what those things are yet, but that is what we're aiming to get to. And then so now we'll be looking to, to inform what do we need to measure to get to that point. Some of the specific things we are working on at the moment though is looking at chemical free tick control, so tick vaccines. So we've got a few uh, irons in the fire in that space. And also this improved pain management or pain relief. And so in some recent result surveys we did with producers, it's it's quite a high uh, percentage of producers that aren't using any pain relief uh, for the basic husbandry practices of castration or dehorning. And so they're areas that we're looking at showing, demonstrating some, some uh, op options for using pain relief. Now this is in response to a consumer insight. That consumers, and we want to be on the front foot of this, so not being told what the Australian meat industry needs to do, but rather being able to show consumers in a proactive way of what we're doing as producers to really take care of animals. Because this is becoming an expectation that, not that they know about those individual practices, but there's an expectation that we're really looking after the animals and they're not in any pain at any stage. Now, carbon neutral by 2030, and that was a pretty bold uh, goal that we set a couple of years ago uh, in MLA. And there's two prongs to that that we're attacking. That is through how do you, what, what do you put in place to avoid emissions through me methane emissions? And what do you do to about carbon storage? And so a couple of, we're, we're on a pathway. I'm not going to go through the details of this, but this is our roadmap to becoming carbon neutral. And this is all on our website. And this is quite a handy website, the website part of the, uh, of MLA's website on carbon neutral. It's all in this infographic style. So it's quite easy to follow along what we're doing here. So really at the moment, we're at a stage where we're just trying to work out how do you account, what's the accounting mechanism you need to have in place to be able to man measure, are you doing a good job of methane, managing methane emissions or soil carbon storage? So we want to have accounting methods that are recognised by government um, and other organisations so they get accepted for things like carbon trading systems. So we've also started some work around supplements. Are there certain supplements that could reduce methane emissions and also looking at sort of different soil carbon storage mechanisms as well. Now, I'm not going to steal Brad's thunder here because he's going to talk about the Southern Mouldy Breed project later on today. But as an example of where we're investing in genetics to try and progress the use of genetics to inform better decisions is a Southern Mouldy Breed project. So regardless of coat colour or breed society those animals might be assigned to. For the commercial production sector, thinking about how do we produce the best animal possible to meet those consumer expectations, looking at a multi-breed genetic evaluation system so you can compare all breeds on a level playing field and work out for your breeding objective, what are the types of animals that you might need in that production system. Now MSA, um, this is my pet because I've been working in MSA for the last 18 years um, but so uh, but it's been around for over 20 years now it's well entrenched in the industry and it's just become in all honesty it's just become the expectation or the norm that when we're um, producing um, beef it's going out with an eating quality claim on it and so to be a part of MSA as a producer doesn't cost anything and uh, it might cost you a vendor declaration and that's about it but the pro premiums being paid to producers on their eating quality performance, they're, they're not set by MLA and they vary around the country. But those processes that are using MSA to underpin their brands that they're putting out to the marketplace 
are starting to develop levels of payments based on your eating quality performance. And so we're seeing that evolve uh, every year. And so that last year, based on those premiums, there was an extra $170 million that actually went back to producers directly because of those price differences. So over half of all the cattle in Australia now are MSA graded. Uh, it's not, not everything's actually eligible. So that's the stuff to keep, keep an eye out for. There's more to come because we're actually doing, <coughs> excuse me, we're actually making sure by in the next couple of years, every single animal in this country is eligible to be MSA graded and have the eating quality accurately described. It might mean some of that meat is actually not fit to go into a grilling steak option, but we're going to be able to tell you that. And so we've still got some areas to go as in uh, some older cow work, some older females. Uh, Wagyu's are eligible for MSA right now, but we're investigating whether there's anything quite unique about that breed that's not captured uh, by its carcass traits. Um, entire males, so those yearling type bulls that might be fed for, uh, in a feedlot situation as well. Now to support uh, that quality system, but also yield is the, our investments in objective carcass technologies. And this is a space that you'll really see MLA spending a lot more time in the immediate future. We've been spending quite a bit of time in the last few years in uh, looking at various technologies, whether it might be out of the medical industry, uh, even out of the airport security industry, you know, CT scanning, all these things to work out whether, so the quality grading at the moment is done by trained assessors and they use visual standards to make those, but it's a, it's a manual process. So it works, but we're looking to see if we can make it even more efficient, time effective, cost effective, and so on with some of these technologies. So that's what you're seeing here, a range of options. So this is at the very simplest, an app on a phone that's taking a picture of the eye muscle, so the, the piece of steak that we're used to eating and calculating all those quality traits on that piece of meat to tell us what the eating quality might be. When we partner that up with some technology using X-ray, this can tell us about yield. This type of, so this is a, this is a sheep, but we're put installing this in beef as well, is to use dual X-ray technology and CT scanning to let us know how much uh, meat, bone and fat is in that animal. And so we can do that at the moment pretty uh, with some equations and the measurements we can take. But this would give us really precise indication of the yield of this animal. This gives us really precise indication of eating quality. And you partner those up and you get some pretty powerful information for producers and processors, but to work out the true value of those animals. And this would be a really powerful combination of information to have as producers uh, to be able to inform some of those on farm decisions as well, is how do you use, how do you balance yield and eating quality together to get the highest value animal uh, possible? So underpinning all of this uh, is quite a set of programs or forums and a whole range of things you can get involved in if you'd like to learn more about this. And I've, I've only picked out, I've cherry picked a few things MLA does. There's just so much more and I'm here all day and I've got information up on the, the back as well. But we have an adoption program that underpins all of this. And the, the strategy behind this is a whole range of awareness activities, not too dissimilar to what we're doing today. Come and hear what we're up to. Does any of this trigger some interest at various forums? Uh, we work with livestock advisors on this as well to go through, okay, so there's something I wanna learn more about on, it might be how to use my feed carcass feedback, or it might be how do I use genetics or nutrition. That, we've got a whole range of programs and that feed into that. So Edge Network might be something you've heard. It's been around for a long time. Breadwell Fedwell workshops, they've been running in this district for a fair while. So partnering up reproduction, genetics information with nutrition information as well. Now, if you are really looking to then go, okay, I really want to implement some of this stuff on my place and like to do it in a group of producers so we can learn from each other and share the results. That's something we would love to get involved in. And we're doing that through two mechanisms at the moment, through what we call producer demonstration sites. So this is, a, this is really where producers decide something that's uh, important for their region or for their type of production system, come together as a group and implement things on your place and then share the results. And that could be over a two or three year process, as well as profitable grazing systems. Now that's the name we give, it's an umbrella name of all lots of, um, Lots of different programs, uh, I should say training programs, if you like, 
but uh, more like a coaching program over a 12 month period. Now that examples of some of those are we've got satellite foraging programs, um, uh, a reap lamb, or lamb survival, no, that's not relevant to today, but things around uh, survival and fertility as well. Supporting all of that, we're doing a lot of work with advisors and livestock consultants as well to make sure that you're getting all the support that you need from the people you might rely on. So this is just diving into that just a little bit further is that what we really love doing and helping to facilitate is small groups of producers that want to do something to test out on their farm and demonstrate it in practice. So take it out of the research world and put it actually in real, real practice. We support that with providing, um, or you might find someone yourself that we can work with, a coach or a facilitator that can help uh, draw some of these learnings out. And we've always got technical experts on, on hand to help unravel what that research means as well. And as I said, supported by some of these training packages that are really customised to suit the needs of the region or the, or the producers themselves. So where is it happening right now? So you can jump on our website and actually see where this is happening right now if you're not involved in something. So for that producer demonstration site program, we've got 60 active projects. Now they span multiple sites. So we've actually got over 300 sites around the country. And what we're, the reason we like investing and supporting these programs, it's been shown that when we invest in a producer demonstration site, there's a benefit of over $6 a hectare back to the producers that actually adopt adopt that, that work. And so every time we've done one of these producer demonstration sites, I should say almost every time we do them, the producers that are involved, 100% of them change what they're doing because it's shown to be beneficial. And then they, the idea is you also bring around people in the region to come and look at what you're up to as well. And a lot of the time, half of those people go home and change something as well. The profitable grazing system um, concept. So this is where we've got facilitators around the country. We've got 25 different packages available for that right now. And that program is actually showing by producers that are investing in themselves to be part of that program, they're getting about a $17 a hectare benefit uh, back to their, their business. And then what the other thing we're investing in is these big, big integrated research projects around the country uh, where we're bringing together research and adoption at, at the same time. So pretty much we've got the whole country covered, if you like, on these adoption programs, uh, but always looking at new opportunities for producers like yourselves that might want to get involved in something or set something up for this region. So I'm just going to leave you with a bit of a call out for any of you innovative producers that might like to go to Beef Australia in Rockhampton in May, is that we're actually looking for, uh, for the next couple of weeks, uh, I think till the 1st of April, uh, we're looking for any producers that might have implemented something new on farm or within with their maybe a supplier that they're working with and done, have done something different and, and creative and uh, we'd love to hear about it. And we're offering a, a trip to Beef Australia for uh, a lucky producer that might be able to come forward with some of those ideas. So thanks, Dale. And uh, hopefully it's sort of set a bit of a, a scene of what we think the, the cattle market and industry looks like in the next little while and what MLA is going to be doing on your behalf to, to capitalise on that. Thank you.